Today our distinguished speaker is Dr. Adam Steltzner from NASA's JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab. Last year, Dr. Steltzner was the lead engineer of the Curiosity rover's entry, descent and landing phase, and helped design, build, and test the Sky Crane landing system. On August 6, 2012, NASA successfully landed Curiosity in Gale Crater on Mars. The overall objectives of that mission, including investigating Mars habitability, studying its climate and geology, and collecting data for a manned mission to, to Mars. Previously, Dr. Steltzner worked on several flights, including Galileo, Cassini, Mars Pathfinder, and Mars Exploration Rovers. A native Californian who grew up in the Bay Area, he attended the College of Marin, went on to obtain a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering at UC Davis, a Master of Science degree in Applied Mechanics at Caltech, and a PhD in Engineering Mechanics at University of Wisconsin. Senators, please help me welcome Dr. Adam Steltzner. Thank you, Senator Knight. Um, I'm from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and in case you don't know it, this is what it looks like. We're down in Pasadena, and uh, nestled up against the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, I hail from the Bay Area, and I chose this slide uh, because it's, it's fitting, and I'll, I'll get to the story of that. Um, I'm a, a third generation Californian, uh, born in Oakland, raised in the Bay Area, and this is a, a, a picture taken of the Golden Gate Bridge not far from the home I, I was raised in. Uh, it's also fitting because although you can't quite see it here, the uh, constellation of Orion is visible over the Bay Area. And I was 22 years old and uh, playing uh, rock and roll music and probably not headed for much success when I became curious about the motion of the stars in the night sky. I didn't know that it was the constellation of Orion, uh, but I did notice that constellation. And that curiosity led me to the College of Marin, where I thought I needed to sign up for an astronomy class because I wanted to learn why the stars moved. That had a physics course associated with it. I took that physics course and it changed my life. I would move from uh, College of Marin to UC Davis, uh, down to Southern California to Caltech, and eventually finishing my graduate work off in uh, Wisconsin. So California is a big part of my life, and it's been a big part of the exploration of Mars. So this is Mars. Uh, from, for eons, humans have wondered about Mars. We've uh, stared up in the sky and noticed that slightly orange, slightly fuzzier object that doesn't move the way the other stars moved. And when we finally figured out that there were planets, we noticed that this was one of them. As soon as we had telescopes, we looked up and we saw structures on the surface of Mars that we were certain were roads and canals, civilization. We were pretty sure that life existed on Mars. That question, are we alone in the, in the universe, in our own solar system, and is there life on Mars, that question has stayed with us for quite some time. Well, I had the privilege of leading a team that was asked to try and answer that question by putting a rover on the surface of Mars. And not just anywhere on Mars, but here. Uh, this is a slightly dark image of a place on Mars called Gale Crater. And in the image, at the edges, is the rim of this crater. And in the center is a massive mountain by the name of Mount Sharp. It stands 15,000 feet tall. And all of you know that that's taller than any mountain in California or the lower 48 for that matter. And down in the shadows there, between the edge of the crater and that mountain, our team was asked to put a rover. To do that, we we're gonna to have to do better than we'd ever done before. So here's another image of that crater and that mountain, now shown from above. This is shaded, so the, the orange things are high and the blue things are low. And those circles, or squished circles, those ellipses, are our uncertainty, our landing footprints from all the past missions to Mars. And you can see, starting in 76 
and marching on down in, we slowly got better at hitting the bullseye. But between 2008, the Phoenix mission, and Curiosity, we were going to have to get a whole lot better to fit down in that safe blue spot there at the bottom of the crater between the mountain and the rim. And when we got down there, we were going to have to land a rover bigger than any rover we'd seen before. So this is the, all the rovers we've put on Mars. The little tiny one, Sojourner, we landed on, uh, on Mars as almost a lark, an experiment of could we put a spacecraft on Mars for, for, for very little money? And the answer was yes. We landed that little Sojourner rover. She landed for, survived for about 30 days. That excited us. We returned with another rover in 2004, actually a pair, Spirit and Opportunity. They were twins. And they did great work. They showed us that at one point in the past, Mars had been wet. And that's very important for that first question we're looking at, that question about life. Because we know from Earth where there's moisture, where there's water, there's life. And where there is no water, there is no life. So Mars had water, but Spirit and Opportunity couldn't tell us much about it. Had the water been on the surface for a day, a minute, thousands of years? Had it been salty? Had it been acidic? In short, had that waterborne environment been habitable? Those questions left hanging, and in comes curiosity. She's 900 kilos, 2,000 pounds to you and me, and she is packed to the gills with all the equipment we need to figure out if the, last, if the old uh, environment of Mars was habitable for life. But landing her was hard, because she's big. This is her next to a, a Mini Cooper. We're going to have that model out on the west steps tomorrow. So we looked at all sorts of different ways of getting her safely down to the surface. That final last little bit, that touchdown, really caused us a lot of challenge. We tried airbags. We'd used those before for the little tiny Sojourner rover and for Spirit and Opportunity, bouncing that final last step onto the surface of Mars. It ends up being curiosity so big, there is no fabric known to humankind strong enough to make airbags that would work. So we looked at legged landers. Now, Viking in the 70s was a legged lander. And maybe we could just put a rover on top. Well, we already knew that legged landers were a little tippy, a little top heavy, and that they were prone to, to being unstable in very rough terrain. We are going to have to go to rough terrain, and putting a, a, a one-ton rover on the top makes that job even tougher. So that was out. We tried to solve the problem of, of that tippiness by spreading the legs out, making it really squash to get it nice and stable. But it ends up being that puts the propulsion system, which has got a whole bunch of explosive fuel, in very close proximity to the rocks that you land on. And exploding on, on landing is considered typically poor form. So that was out. And we were sort of pushed by the forces of nature into, a, into an architecture that at the time we called direct placement. But, but folks have, have come to know it as the sky crane. And as if truth is frequently stranger than fiction, that's the method we chose. And in case you were too busy last summer, this is what happened. Coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. Vehicle's just reported via tone that it has started guided entry. We have seen peak deceleration. should deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Each hill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers descending. 
standing by for bachelor separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky cream. Sky cream is started. Single dot, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. So the evening of August 5th was a good night for us down at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And it left Curiosity, wheels down, ready to begin her mission on the surface of Mars. And she's there, as the, as the uh, President's science advisor said, 2,000 pounds of American ingenuity. As the back of your iPhone box says, designed in California. $2.5 billion came through the state on its way to many places inside the state and uh, throughout the country, uh, building her. Sometimes people say, two and a half billion dollars, as if we stuffed it into a chest and hucked it out into space. But we didn't. We spent it here in California and elsewhere in this country over the span of 10 years with thousands of high-tech jobs and creating a lot of interest. Now, we don't only just go to Mars. We also look at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out at the rest of our solar system and our universe, be it Saturn, Jupiter, looking for planets that might have life on them or be life-sized around other stars. And we take those instruments and those techniques and that smarts, and we also turn it to our own world, look back at Earth to do Earth science, to answer questions that can be quite practical in the end. My uncle is a, is a farmer, uh, sit, grows citrus down in Lindsay and, and, and wine grapes up in Napa. And very basic climate, groundwater, and other data can be answered from orbital assets that, uh, that either we are involved in placing up there um, or that we analyze the data from. But perhaps at JPL and at NASA, we're at our best when we inspire. This is one of my favorite images. It's an image um, of the undercarriage of the rover, of Curiosity, as she sits at our landing site in Gale Crater. Off here to the edge, that little black strip is a set of beautiful black sand dunes that eventually we will shimmy across onto the shoulders of that mountain, that's Mount Sharp there, and continue our exploration of the ancient environment of Mars to understand habitability. But it also represents California ingenuity and American know-how sitting on the surface and inspiring the next generation of people to be involved in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You all just were in, in um, Long Beach, I believe, a couple weeks ago, talking about how we can help get Californian, the next generation of Californians interested and involved in STEM subjects. And I'm a great example of a non-traditional way, uh, sort of a circuitous path, but hooking the next generation on the excitement of the fundamental excitement of what it means to be human and explore is certainly by far the most positive way that we can get kids to help this state uh, uh, compete in, in the global marketplace in the future. So um, thank you for involving uh, your time here today and in inviting me, and I will open it up at this point for questions. Thank you. 
Yes. Great. The question was by the distinguished Senator Knight, how long will it be on Mars? Uh, until someone brings it back is the answer to that, which I actually look forward to. Um, my daughter is in the audience up there, and my 10-year-old daughter, Caledonia, and perhaps uh, she'll bring it back. But um, uh, it will, it's warranted life is one Mars year, which is a little bit short of one Earth year, about 690 Mars days is how long the prime mission is planned for. That will allow us to see one full seasonal cycle on the surface of Mars. Any other questions? Yes. So what do we know about Mars today? We know an awful lot more than we did a decade ago. Mars had water on the surface. Uh, it had an environment that that may have been, may have had conditions that would have been habitable for life in the past. In fact, I believe tomorrow we are likely to be making a, uh, a news conference uh, out at Washington, at, in NASA headquarters about some of the findings to date, so I, I'm on pretty strict orders not to scoop that news conference. But um, um, Mars is, was, is, was not what it looks like today. Today it looks like the Mojave Desert, dry, kind of barren. As anybody who lives in the Mojave Desert knows, there's a ton of life out in the desert. It just takes slowing down a little bit and looking. But, um, and that may actually be the case for Mars. But Mars was in the past wet and, uh, and had conditions that may well have been habitable for life. It may sound like a silly question. What, uh, climate change, it's atmospheric. Obviously, we know what the... Uh, um, oh, okay. It may sound like a, a silly question, but uh, climate change, which is atmospheric, yeah. we know what the impacts are for, for Earth. Does climate change atmospherically have any... Do we know impacts with other planets, you know? And, that's a great question. So um, for Mars and Earth, Mars is much smaller than Earth. And so Mars ha Mars Mars's gravity has a hard time hanging on to its atmosphere as well as we do here. So one of the reasons that it doesn't have as much atmosphere as it may have had in the early times, some of the climate change that may have occurred, is, is due just to loss of atmosphere due to the size of the planet, the fundamental size. Venus, however, is a, is a better analog for Earth, and we know that climate, the climate's very different there than it is here. It's about 400, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. It would melt lead, and, uh, and part of that is because a lot of carbon dioxide has been liberated into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide that's bound in rocks here on Earth. If it gets hot enough, those rocks can liberate the uh, carbon dioxide. So we can learn some um, analogs and some um, traits associated with what might happen for climate change here on Earth from other planets. And I believe there will be a panel uh, tomorrow, is it, that, that will we'll have some atmospheric scientists on it who can speak more to that. Other questions? Yo, excuse me if this is too personal a question. Okay. But as you rightfully point out, we've come back from Long Beach. Right. Very curious as to what we can learn from a system they have there, which is uh, referred to in many ways, but including linked learning, how to engage students more so that what they're learning has more meaning for them and can begin to focus on some sort of career or higher educational path. Given your own definition of your education being circuitous, getting from high school to almost 20 years later, your, your PhD, is there anything you can share with us as to how it was that you weren't engaged in high school, but you became such a scholar in, in your later years? Mm -hmm. uh, just your own timing of your own evolution and maturity, or was there something that might have been presented earlier to you that might have caught your attention? That's a great question. Um, I think ultimately, certainly for myself, and it may be the case for others, that uh, you have to find something within the student or within a potential student, I was really was no longer a student, um, 
that lights uh, a, a thirst, an interest, um, and the student has to be able to follow that interest. So there can be many impediments to that. In my case, to take it personally, uh, sort of a fear of failure was part of that. And I had to get old enough and be bored enough to be willing to fail in order to really pursue my interests. Um, I think exposing children to a range of uh, possible stimulus, possible um, threads of curiosity that they can follow, and then looking to make sure that they have the, the, um, all the, the resources, and I mean that both fiscal resources, um, uh, but also uh, environmental resources, to allow them to, to follow that, I think is really the key, or at least was the key for me. Welcome. Any other questions? Okay. That's my, my chance. Um, what would happen if you had a human being on Mars? Could he or she survive on Mars? So, uh, and why can't we transport? We, we, we've had someone on, on you know, mm -hmm. go around. We've had someone who actually have uh, uh, landed on planet, uh, on, on the moon. Um, can we actually physically take someone over there and could they survive? So there's been a, a few um, questions that were hanging open for us about putting human beings on the surface of Mars. One is the, one is frankly radiation exposure. Once you get outside the Earth's magnetic field, the sun is a source of radiation that uh, is harmful to humans and you need to shield them from it uh, and you need to limit the time of exposure. The trip to Mars is a long trip. Let's say it'll probably take a year, year and a half, depending on the exact path you'd use with the human. And then the opportunity to come back again happens at about every 26 months. So the human beings are going to be exposed for a long period of time. Now, we've come to recognize that the surface radiation levels on the surface of Mars, using an instrument that we put on Mars with curiosity, are not quite as high as we had been concerned about earlier, which emboldens us to feel that it might not be as challenging from a radiation perspective. Um, in general, uh, human beings are delicate and, uh, and they're a bit expensive to move about. They go around with uh, oxygen and water and food. They get terribly cranky if you keep them in too tight quarters. And so uh, when you put all those together, it, it, it's a bit more expensive than placing robots on the surface. But I certainly want to see humans follow uh, our robots because I think when we're exploring, we are really stretching out as a species and we're asking questions about who we are. And when we ask those questions, we're better for asking them regardless of the answers we get back. I believe that we would have been better for making a smoking hole on the surface of Mars. I would have not been here talking to you today, and I would not, it would not have been as positive an experience. But as a people, we would have been better for trying to do this than for not trying. And so I believe there's something fundamentally human in the act of exploration. And I think humans involved in exploration are, in that sense, absolutely natural and appropriate. So I look, I look forward to putting boot prints on top of those wheel tracks. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>